We had an event during World Standards Week where we uh, had SDOs and government folks making presentations, a panel discussion, talking about this significant area. A lot's been written about the economic benefits of standards, but not so much in terms of the benefits to, to human health and safety. So Joe had invited us back to give like a one-year update, and you're going to hear from uh, our panel. We've been at it, I guess, since January, meeting about every six weeks with then additional work being done in between those meetings. So um, a lot of good work has taken place. Just a couple of housekeeping items um, for those of you who might not have been on this morning's uh, program. This event is being recorded. Um, if you don't want to be recorded, then just make sure your audio and your video is off. The audio, everyone should be muted um, when they first join. Um, when we get to the discussion, you can ask questions in the chat whenever you like and we'll queue them up um, when we get to the discussion point uh, if you have any questions you can if you're on zoom you can raise your hand and we'll unmute you to speak if you're in the room just make sure you use your push button mic and we'll recognize you that way so i'm going to sit down and monitor the zoom and turn it over to scott Ayers. thank you jim uh, thank you for having us back this year um I guess I'll, I'll introduce myself to you all. My name is Scott Ayers. I work at the US Consumer Product Safety Commission. I've been there for about 12 years and, and most of my work involves working on uh, SDO uh, standards bodies. And so this is something I'm excited to be a part of because as a participant in the standards development process, I'm always interested in uh, making sure that the standards are as good as they can be. Uh, I'm interested in getting other participants uh, to participate. Uh, I'm looking to motivate them. I I'm looking to get them to join. Uh, and so this is a great opportunity to kind of talk about the impact because personally, my feeling is that people participate in standards development because they want to make an impact. And so this is a great way to kind of articulate what that impact is that they can make and hopefully encourage them to participate and bring uh, brilliant ideas, uh, bring new new ways of, of tackling concepts, and just being, bring different perspectives to the standards development process. So I'm, I'm very excited to be part of this. Um, and I will now turn it over to my colleague, uh, David Roth, to talk about his motivations. Thanks, Scott. Uh, my name is David Roth. I'm with UL Standards and Engagement where I'm the director of data science. And uh, a few years ago, uh, the data science team at, at the time it was Underwriters Laboratories was brought into the standards organization with a couple of very specific um, asks, if you will, uh, roles that we were asked to be uh, to fill when we came into the standards organization. Um, and one of those roles that we were asked to fulfill is how can we measure the impact of the standards that we write uh, going forward. So one of my motiva motivations for this is to uh, make sure that I'm doing what my boss has asked me to do. Uh, but on a more serious note, um, it is really um, a mission to ensure that we as an organization are fulfilling our mission. Uh, UL Standards and Engagement shares a mission with other parts of the UL organization of working for a safer world. And so without understanding if our standards are actually working in fulfilling that mission, we're potentially losing the opportunity to be more effective in that role. So that's really the first motivation here for us as a standards development organization that has been focused on safety for a long time is to ensure that we've got the data to support the work that we're doing. The second motivation that we have relative to measuring the impact of these standards is to make sure that our efforts are being directed to the right topics. In other words, it makes no difference in the world if we write a standard and it sits on the shelf and nobody uses it, and it would be a better use of all of our time and resources if we took that and put it towards something that has a, an actual impact. And so that's a, a critical motivation for this is to ensure we invest in the right standards um, as we move forward. 
And then finally, the last motivation is that we have many standards, um, but you know the standards development process is an imperfect uh, way to develop uh, you know a standard to ensure human health and safety. Many times we get it right. Sometimes we don't get it right on the first time. And by measuring the impact of changes to the standards, we have the opportunity to correct and to move forward and, as Scott was saying, continually improve those standards to get the kind of uh, result that we're hoping to do. And now I'll turn it over to Diana Jones. Hi, thank you for having me here. Um, everything that he said, uh, <laughs> we're also, I, I'm with the ISCA, which is the International Safety Equipment Association, and I'm their technical director, technical program director and, uh, and development. And uh, so my role there at the International Safety Equipment Association is the, the development and the maintenance of our standards for personal protective equipment. And ICA is a, we're a manufacturers association. So we have manufacturers that, you know, that, that are our members and we're the voice of the, of those manufacturers. But at the same time, we're developing those, those PPE standards that are, you know, we really want to dig into and really understand how effective are they? Are they doing just because we've developed a standard doesn't mean that it's going to be, you know, widely adopted. So that, you know, being part of this, this group and this team and working on this has given us a, a better understanding of what the, the key concepts are and, you know, what to look for, you know, from when you're developing a new new standard from inception with a new idea, there's a new you know there's a new hazard or a new product out there, um, you know moving all the way towards a, a standard that's just going in for revision, right? Or or if it, there's a standard, is it something that you know might not be if not, might not be used out there? Is it worth you know keeping out keeping there? Um, keeping it there as a standard out there. So my motivation is more from an SDO perspective, and you know, and, and the the benefits that that you know the impact will have on on what we do. Thank you. Oh, and then I think we're going to Andrew. Yes, thank you, Diana. Uh, pleasure to be here, at least virtually. I'm sorry I could not attend and be there in person with you all. Uh, I am Andrew Kapp. I'm the research manager for the data science team in UL Standards and Engagement. My personal motivation is I'm just a curious guy. And this is, a, as we're going to discuss over the next hour and a half or so, this is a, a very important issue, but also a very tough nut to crack. Uh, how do you assess the, uh, effectively assess the impact of these voluntary consensus standards? Uh, so my personal motivation is, is I'm curious to get this done, how can we do this? But as you've already heard from my colleagues representing different stakeholders within the uh, standards ecosphere, um, we're also very curious as to what motivates the other uh, stakeholders, those who promulgate, uh, use uh, standards. In fact, uh, I'm directing the efforts of UL standards engagement to begin our process of uh, assessing the impact on health and safety of our standards. And key to our process is we actually get the stakeholders involved in the process as early as possible. Uh, as you've already identified by the very speakers we have today, the different stakeholders, they have different priorities when assessing impacts. I look at motivation as really being a, a, a vector and it's really what, what drives the motivation. All the stakeholders are motivated. They want to help determine what the impacts of these standards that they are promulgating or they're adopting are. But their reasons may be slightly different. And for the results of this impact assessment and impact assessment to be accepted by all the stakeholders, the assessment's got to meet all these multiple priorities. So we're very, it's very important to understand this perspective. And we like to engage our stakeholders in the process early and keep them engaged throughout. So we're constantly trying to address these multiple priorities, these different underlying factors affecting the motivation. Um, it's critical to the process. So I guess one thing that uh, maybe to transition a little bit, just to make sure that we level set everyone, um, we had the workshop at the last um, ANSI World Standards Week to talk about this topic. 
And from that, we formed a working group that includes uh, the folks here on the panel, but many others uh, that have come from government, academia, as well as uh, various um, manufacturers and you know, essentially a broad a group of stakeholders. And it, it's our intent to uh, develop this process and these viewpoints on how to measure the impact of these standards and document those into a white paper that will be published uh, so that we can get um, this information out to the various groups that, that might be uh, helped uh, by using this. Uh, we have a draft of that white paper that is still um, not quite ready for prime time. Uh, so that's uh, why we're here to give you an update rather than to announce that, that white paper. But um, the other key thing that we want to make sure that we have time to do today is to gather your questions and your input. You are all stakeholders in this process of helping us to develop a process or a methodology uh, for measuring the impact of the standards. So as we go through these key concepts and as we uh, develop the, uh, the white paper, we invite your participation today and overall as we move forward with that. So if we could have the next slide, please. And let's go on to the next one. So I think Diane is up front. All right, I'm up. So what do you get when you get, when you have a bunch of engineers sitting around a table or sitting on a Zoom call and they're trying to figure something out, <laughs> right? You're gonna come up with an equation that's gonna solve all of your problems. <laughs> uh, so we uh, we came up with this this equation here. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of give you a, a just a little bit of an overview of it, and then each of us are going. To, uh, my panel my co panelists are going to jump into the different areas of it. So when we when we looked at you know what is impact, right? What is what does that what does that actually mean? Like, and how do we how would we measure impact? And what we came up with was that it is the effectiveness or the influence that the standard actually has on safety multiplied now multiplied by the conformance. Now the conformance is you know I know when you think of conformance I know my mind originally went conformity assessment, but there's so much more to do with conformance than, than just that. That's just one small piece of it. And we'll, you know, and I think Andrew's gonna get into it a little bit later, but the the effectiveness of the of the actual standard itself is that the, the ability of the standard to produce a desired change, right? So is it something, you know, if you want to take a look at um, injury data or costs to, you know, when there's an injury that happened, what is the cost associated with that? So these are sort of like, you know, fixed, these are numbers that can be, that actually can be measured. However, when you get to the conformance side, it's a little more gray, right? It's, um, you know, how do we, how does the, the product or how do the people that are using the product adhere to the actual standard? And, um, I think Andrew's going to get into that next or in a little bit, but, uh, the the conformance can be viewed as kind of like you know on a on a scale right of as a, a high low type medium where there's you know conformance mandated by by government by law and you know all the way down to you know something that might be best practices and uh, you know we when we we started talking about the the equation itself you know is it something that do we is it multiplied? Are we adding these two things together? You know, we did have that discussion, and I know we've had that discussion with with other people as well. And um, you know, these are related to each other, right? And they're they're a product of each other. So they they're 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 um, they need to be they need to be looked at together because one does actually influence the other. Just to, just to add a little bit onto to what Diana was saying is. You know the, the uh, danger of having those engineers in the room and coming up with an equation is uh, that you can lead, might lead you to the idea that we can come up with you know ninety eight point two percent impact or something like that. And as you'll discover as we go throughout the rest of the, the conversation, and this really is you know we're going to try to have a conversation, and we invite you as as well toward the end. Uh, but as we look at that, what you'll find is that this is not yet an exact science. 
And in each of these cases, what we'll be doing is talking about how can you assess each of these factors, but in some of those cases, there may be qualitative ways to assess each of the factors as we go forward. So um, we've not yet got this down to a science where we can put exact numbers on this, but uh, we do feel like this uh, working definition is a nice way to think through the problem of what we're uh, what we're talking about there. So let's let's go to the next slide, please. So another key concept that we'd like to uh, introduce, and uh, we'll tie it into the overall um, impact equation as we go through the rest of the conversation, but. You know, a standard goes through a life cycle. And if we want to take a, a broad view at the life cycle of a voluntary consensus standard, there the first part is the idea of developing the standard. So pulling together the technical committee, going through in the process of actually coming up with the requirements of those standards is certainly the first part of that uh, process. But then when we talk about the voluntary standards adoption process, the next thing that needs to occur is people need to become aware of the standard that has just been developed. And that may or may not be something that is uh, easily done, especially where there is a new standard that is being uh, put into place. So in order for a standard to ultimately have impact, people need to become aware of it, and then they need to adopt it. Um, and that adoption process, again, can be facilitated by things like uh, regulations, by uh, market forces, and a number of other pieces, but they are distinct steps in the voluntary standards uh, process that we're thinking about there. Next, there is the implementation, and what we mean by the differentiation between implementation versus adoption is Adoption kind of stops with that decision that I am going to have my process, my uh, product, my system to conform to that standard. But now the implementation is actually taking the steps to ensure that my processes, my product actually uh, conforms to that. So there is this activity associated with putting the requirements associated with the standard into use within that, uh, that place where the, the standard is going to be uh, affecting the end product. The next stage um, that occurs with, I would say 99.99% of standards is the revision process. Um, standards are not static, uh, whether it's because the technology is moving forward or whether it's because we have learned how the standard might be improved but any standard typically will go through this revision process. And then finally, at some point in time, it's likely that that standard is no longer used and useful and will be retired. So that's the chevrons you see at the bottom is that voluntary standards adoption model that we've, uh, we've used to help us think through the, the problem of impact. The, uh, the curve, the, the rough hand-drawn uh, on a computer curve that you see there um, is uh, what does the impact of that standard look like over the life cycle of the standard? And one of the things that may not be intuitively obvious, but is that a standard begins to have impact as soon as that development cycle starts. Uh, we've talked through in the working group of multiple situations where the people who are involved in the process of developing the standard through the technical committee are bringing the concepts, the requirements, the ideas behind that standard to their organizations. And in fact, they're beginning that, uh, that adoption process and can start to change things within the organization, even while the standard is in development. Obviously, as more and more people become aware of the standard, that impact grows because, again, people begin to understand what's going on there. It influences thinking. It influences design. It uh, begins to uh, uh, add to those impacts that started even when the standard was developed. Similarly, as we drive adoption, whether it's through you know, making uh, the standard available through various 
organizations and so forth. We continue to see a slow but steady increase in the impact that the standard has as more people adopt it. Implementation is where the impact of the standard grows dramatically. And again, as we'll talk about with the ideas of conformance, how much impact that standard might have is going to be directly related to the number of people that implement the standard against their products, systems, or uh, processes. You'll see two pieces of the, uh, the line that's right above uh, revision. Uh, and the uh, solid line where you see the bump in effect in uh, impact is meant to uh, illustrate the idea that our revisions are meant to improve the standard and in fact, improve the outcome of the standard. However, the dotted line acknowledges the fact that there are sometimes unintended consequences to the revisions that we make to a standard. And it's possible, and again, I would say that there are people who have examples of this, where the revision to a standard actually decreases its impact whether, for example, it increases the cost associated with complying with the standard, and therefore fewer people use that standard to develop their products, or whether it's just a misunderstanding of what the driver of a particular outcome associated with safety or health is on that standard. Pretty obvious that when the standard is retired, the impact of that associated with that standard will decline, but then uh, hopefully, there's a standard that takes its place and begins the uh, entire impact cycle all over again. So as the other key thing to think about um, in terms of measuring the effectiveness or excuse me, measuring the impact of a standard is the measures we use to try to assess the impact of a standard will change over this life cycle. During the early phases of this um, life cycle, adoption cycle, for example, in development and awareness and even in adoption, the hard data associated with a change to um, injury outcomes or the change in health status that we're trying to affect by the standard, those are not yet going to be measurable. Because the standard is in its infancy, if you will, um, it won't uh, that data won't exist. So what we've developed is the concept of leading indicators, helping us to assess the impact of the standard, even as it is beginning in this, in this life cycle. So uh, some thoughts on that indicate the idea of, is the standard being acknowledged in industry trade associations, is it being picked up in the media as something that's going to be a positive impact on the organization um, or the, the organizations that might use it? Are there um, you know, other uh, measurements that say that the standard will be used by organizations as they, as they move forward? So the uh, idea of development through adoption, we're generally talking about leading indicators that will give us a sense that the standard will have impact rather than being able to go through the, uh, the exercise of actually measuring the change in a particular metric associated with the outcome of the standard. As we go through the implementation revision and uh, you know, up to the point of retirement, now we're beginning to be able to pull in lagging indicators where we might be able to look at injury outcomes. We might be able to look at you know, the health effects of a standard as it's actually being measured in the, uh, in the field, if you will. So that's the other um, concept that goes along with this impact curve is the idea that if we want to effectively measure the impact of a standard, we should be using a combination of indicators both leading and lagging indicators to help us truly get this sense of uh, what the impact of a standard is. So I think we'll go, I think we're going to uh, Andrew. Andrew next. Next slide. Excellent, yes. Well, thank you, David. Well, 
So we, David talked about uh, leading indicators proved to be a pretty critical uh, uh, element uh, of this process, um, especially when talking about focusing on the effectiveness component of our equation. I said that what motivated me to uh, in this endeavor is uh, that this is a real challenge and half of the challenge to effectively assessing the health and safety outcomes of these voluntary consensus standards is being able to properly assess the effectiveness, their ability to produce that desired change. First thing we need to keep in mind, it gives us uh, some of the difficulty, is that the incident data that is available is limited. The incidents being the uh, measure of the ultimate outcome. We want to see decreases in given incidents le leading to improvements in safety. Outcome data is available. Uh, for example, with consumer products, we have the Consumer Product Safety Commission NICE database, which is a representative sample of emergency departments uh, from around the country. And if a consumer product is uh, involved in an incident, a uh, record is, is taken. But again, this is limited to uh, emergency departments. And certainly today, there are other opportunities for those that are injured with consumer products to, to receive immediate medical care. Independent clinics, uh, private practitioners, urgent care clinics, none of these are, are captured uh, by the NICE system. The CPSC also has a death certificate uh, uh, database, which is, which is actually quite uh, comprehensive, capturing all the uh, deaths across all 50 states and the territories uh, involving consumer products. Um, but again, this is a very uh, small portion of all the adverse health outcomes, just fatalities. It's very difficult to get representative, credible data on, for example, first aid injuries only, and even harder on uh, near miss uh, incidents involving them. So the outcome data itself is not as robust as we'd like. Add to this that changes in raw data, in the raw data around incidents, changes in incident counts can be misleading by themselves without some idea of the exposures. For example, the numbers of products in use. If we were to see with a given product, a decrease in injuries uh, seen in emergency departments by 50%, on the surface, that would look very promising that we were seeing uh, uh, a desired change an improvement in safety. But if in reality, the number of products in, the, uh, in use had dropped by 80 or 90%, well then we, this raw data uh, is not nearly as impressive and doesn't indicate the same level of improvements in safety. So with the outcome data being limited and changes in raw incident counts alone can potentially be misleading, we have to recognize that incident data is limited. On top of this, even given the incident data we have, the outcome data, it's difficult to attribute any effects to the decreases in injuries or illnesses purely to the standard. That is, that it was the standard that produced these desirable changes. There are other uh, potential contributing factors, known and unknown, and it's difficult to take an, an accounting of these. So taking these two factors together, the limits uh, in incident data and the inherent difficulty in attributing the effects that is decreased incidence to the standard itself, uh, we find that again, as David pointed out, leading indicators, adding lead, leading indicators into our assessment along with the ultimate outcome indicators, decreases in injuries, help produce a more credible uh, assessment of the effectiveness. Scott, I'll leave it to you to discuss some of the inherent difficulties uh, in the conformance element. Uh, before we go to that, I, I, I'd like to add one additional thing, or actually two additional things there. Um, one of the other things that uh, is an interesting and promising um, way potentially to assess the effectiveness of a standard is in uh, predictive modeling or just modeling in general. Um, I was particularly uh, impressed with a recent study done by the CPSC on portable generators, where they use some modeling techniques to take a look at the uh, potential effectiveness of, that, of the two portable generator standards that are out there in, uh, in use today. 
And using uh, that uh, modeling technique, they were able to estimate the potential reduction in injuries to people who were exposed to carbon monoxide from those portable generators in a couple of different scenarios. Now, again, this is the idea of potential impact or potential effectiveness because it's being done through computer simulations and those kind of things. But when the, uh, the modeling is showing that the potential for the reduction in uh, carbon monoxide poisoning is reduced by say 90 some odd percent, then we have a good indication that that standard will have, uh, is effective in reducing the, uh, the hazard that was associated or uh, it was meant to address. The second piece that I would mention on uh, the idea of effectiveness is that when we think about hazard-based safety engineering as a concept, there are a variety of ways to address the ha hazards that might exist in a system, in a process, or in a product. And uh, if we develop a standard or a revision to a standard that completely eliminates a hazard from that particular product or that system, then again, we have solid evidence that the effectiveness of that standard is going to be high. Um, as the products conform to that standard. So uh, if we think about not just assessing the outcome, but assessing the standard and how is that standard addressing the hazard, we may be able to gather more evidence of the effectiveness of the standard because it eliminated a certain number of hazards. It, um, it reduced a certain number of hazards through other mitigating techniques. So there are multiple, and I think one of the themes you'll see in the conversation is there are multiple ways to approach the problem of how do you assess the effectiveness of a standard. So with that, Scott. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. So uh, full disclosure, I am an engineer. And uh, when I'm in a group with other engineers and we create an equation, I think that's a big win. Um, I don't know if the rest of you feel that way, but uh, hooray for me and the rest of us who came up for, with an equation for this. Um, I got involved with this project mainly from the effectiveness side. Uh, I work on a number of voluntary standards committees, and I fully believe that if we have the right representation on there, that we will create the most effective standard possible. And that was kind of my thought process heading into this. I just wanted to make sure that that standard is effective. How do we know it's effective? Blah, 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 blah. However, as we brought in other stakeholders and listened to what their opinion on impact was, something that I hadn't really ever thought of came up over and over again. And, and that really is this idea that we're calling conformance. Uh, CSA, I don't know if anyone from CSA is here today, but uh, when they came in, they just talked about uh, where are their standards referenced. Um, the National Fire Protection Association, I know you guys are here. I know IATMO is here. I don't know if anyone from ICC is here. You guys create model codes. And I can tell you as a fire protection engineer, I think fire sprinklers in homes is a wonderfully effective way to prevent home fires but how many people have bought a home recently that's fairly new that doesn't have fire sprinklers in it? Probably most of you. Um, it's a conformance side of it, right? The, the, the conformance really was something that just blew my mind as I started working on this project. And that's kind of why I'm leading this discussion because I'm just, just I can't, can't believe that I didn't think about this. And really, when we're talking about conformance, we're talking about all the reasons why you're not getting 100% effectiveness from that standard. So it's really just a series of factors that's zero to one that's sort of bringing down that effectiveness. Uh, you can talk about uh, breaking this up, as, as I have done here, into the various components of conformance. And, and some of these components, Components may vary from industry to industry. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you how to calculate your conformance. We're really just gonna tell you what you need to consider when you figure out what your conformance level is. Every industry, every group is probably gonna have different 
uh, uh, inputs to all of this, but but some of the concepts that we really want you to be aware of uh, are included here. And I'll start off with the conformance motivation. Uh, I work at the Consumer Product Safety Commission. I think that uh, what we say is there's 17,000 consumer product categories out there, and a very, very small number of them are actually have any uh, mandatory federal standards. Um, but if it's mandated by the federal government, chances are you're going to get a higher level of conformance than if it's not mandated by the federal government. Uh, what that difference is, I can't tell you. You have to look at your own industry. But um, we can look at the next layer below that. So uh, with consumer products, while most of them are not going to be uh, mandated by the federal government, you probably, if you're making consumer products, probably want to sell it to a major retailer or have them sell it for you. And those major retailers are probably going to be really risk averse. And they're probably going to want to make sure that you meet all the applicable code standards of uh, mandated, whether, or they're, whether they're federally mandated or whether they're voluntary consensus standards. So chances are, if you're making products that you want to sell to consumers, you're probably wanting to have those major retailers sell them for you. And so you're probably going to be looking at trying to meet all of those standards but it's still like one level below what, what's federally mandated. Um, and sometimes you're not. Maybe you're not trying to sell through a major retailer or maybe there, uh, there are other reasons, um, but maybe you want to meet the standard because you just believe that it's the right thing to do as the manufacturer, that, that you think that it, it's, it's going to help your product uh, save lives or prevent injuries or just it's the best thing to do. So, so that conformance motivation is the first idea that we want to put in there. And, and most of these we're kind of terming as very high, high, medium, low. Um, it could be that in some industries, very high might be 99.9%, 0.999. Others, maybe it's a little lower. Maybe it's 95% or 90 or maybe even 80. Maybe that's very high for, for certain things. I think uh, fire sprinklers, uh, they're in all the model codes, but they're not in most of the... Uh, the local codes, so uh, very high compliance for that might be very different than than others. Uh, the next the next idea is the assurance. So yes, your product is meeting the voluntary standard for whatever reason. But now, what you need to understand is is what kind of assurance is there that the stuff you're actually making is meeting it. So that's really going to come down to okay. How is it inspected? Is, is it inspected by a third party certifier? Is it inspected in your own laboratory in your facility? How frequently is it inspected? Are you looking at you know, sampling one out of every hundred products that you make, one out of every thousand? Um, there's a varying degrees of assurance there. So again, high, very high, medium, low, you know, what those numbers are, are really going to to have to be uh, studied from each industry, but but um, as you look at that assurance, you know you may know that you intend that your product meets the standard, but if you're not getting it inspected very regularly, you might not actually have product that you're making that's meeting the standard. The next area is really looking at the human interaction. You may have. Uh, you may want to meet that voluntary standard for whatever reason. You may have a high degree of assurance and inspection, but if the people involved are not knowledgeable or you don't give them the necessary tools or time to do a thorough inspection, maybe there's a lot more escapes than you realize. So that's another factor in this. Uh, and those are three examples of really kind of steady state factors. Uh, those are really what's just as the process is mature. But there's another factor, and this plays into some of the long lifetime products, and that's the actual time that it takes for you, the end user of the product, the standard, the service, whatever it is. Again, I'm coming from consumer product world, so I'm thinking the consumer, but we have people here who are representing the um, workplace. So, you know, it, are the, the uh, owners of the workplace implementing this? Um, really, what it comes down to is 
how quickly are you getting rid of that old product that doesn't conform and getting a new product that does conform? And that's a time dependence area that, that's really going to be uh, difficult to um, ascertain in many cases. What's your, your product half-life? You know, I think about um, my, my kitchen renovation. You know, about three years ago, I replaced all the major appliances in, in my kitchen. I'm expecting to be in my house for maybe another 10 years, and I'm not expecting to replace any of those appliances. But at the same time, a classic example that we have from the world of consumer products is liquid laundry packets from several years ago. Uh, I do my laundry all the time. I buy, you know, the liquid laundry packets. And then, you know, when I run out, I go out to the store and I buy another bag of them. So I might go a couple of months between buying a new bag. So with liquid laundry packets several years ago, we had issues with ingestion. First children, then older adults were looking at this and thinking of it maybe like candy and swallowing it and uh, having major issues with this. And there was the TikTok challenge. TikTok <laughs> challenge too. I have to talk to my daughter about that. Too old for TikTok. Um, <laughs> But what happened was because we had all of these sudden injuries associated with them, that we worked with ASTM to develop a standard for the packaging. So very quickly we could you know, implement that, let's say. Uh, and because liquid laundry packets have a very short lifespan, I mean, you're not keeping it in your kitchen for 13 years like I am with my dishwasher, you're probably keeping it for just a few weeks and then you're going back to the store buying either your favorite brand or whatever's on sale. But very quickly, when those standards go into effect, you might start seeing something in your house very soon. So that kind of gives you the idea that, that there is a time component to this. It does take time for you or, or whatever that end user is to go from having a product that doesn't conform to having a product that does conform. Sometimes it's fairly quick, sometimes it's not, but that can be a very difficult challenge. Uh, think again, uh, model, uh, model codes, sprinklers and homes. I mean, my home is 42 years old, doesn't have sprinklers, it probably never will. Um, someday, you know, they'll probably tear my house down and build a new one. And hopefully by then, uh, sprinklers will be required in the home. But uh, again, it takes a long time for, for some of these products and a short time for others. There's also probably going to be other factors that, that uh, in your particular industry, you may want to consider that we're not sharing because every industry is going to have some of their own unique challenges. But as you analyze the conformance, you really need to look at all of these factors that you can think of that's going to really drag down that effectiveness overall to help give you an overall idea of what that impact is. So I think now we're going to uh, go back to UL for uh, a case study. Yeah, so let's go to the next slide. Um, and just to tee up uh, the case study that we're gonna be talking about today, um, we, as I mentioned, uh, have been working this problem for a little while. And uh, the data science team at uh, UL Standards and Engagement uh, took on a project to take a look at uh, button battery ingestion. Uh, we have a horizontal standard that's being used to, uh, you know, try to secure those button batteries in a wide variety of different um, consumer products uh, to reduce the injuries associated with button cell battery ingestion. Uh, we uh, conducted that uh, assessment and we used uh, NICE data to be able to take a look at that. And we thought we had what was a very wonderful case study of the impact of uh, you know, the UL standard on button batteries. And then we, uh, then we went to some of our stakeholders and we said, uh, let's review this with you and let's see if you think that this uh, information is as good as we think it is. And uh, the bottom line is we learned a lot in that process because we had not engaged all of the appropriate stakeholders. We had taken it on as a science project um, and, uh, and had developed, you know, some of the techniques that we'll be talking about, but we, you know, frankly missed a big component of what uh, is necessary for a, uh, a good assessment of the impact of a voluntary consensus standard. 
So we uh, put that one, we checked, uh, checked the box, we did something associated with that. And then we said, how can we do it better? And I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew, who's leading the effort right now to look at another standard associated with that. And we're beginning that assessment process now. Next slide. Thank you, David. Uh, if you can advance the slide, please. So what we just learned from our, our, our first uh, pilot study, uh, uh, impact assessment, were the two critical features of you cannot rely only on the outcome data and the importance of engaging stakeholders early in the process. So with this newfound knowledge, we looked for um, a model. We looked to see if there was some other pre-existing methodology out there that had already been tested that we could build off of or model our process off of. And sure enough, we found such a model with the CDC's approach to program evaluation for public health programs. We applied this uh, general methodology with a, a little bit of wiggle room, again, because a voluntary consensus standard is a little different than a public health program, though they do share similar goals of helping to reduce uh, injury and illness burden. Uh, we applied this to uh, one, of our, uh, one of our standards. It happened to be UL325, which is the standard for door, drapery, gate, louver, and window operating systems. Well, to be more specific, uh, we applied it to the specific dual entrapment protection requirements, meaning the requirements for both uh, inherent and external protection requirements uh, against entrapment injuries that were published as a revision in uh, December 31st of 1991. So with this specific dual entrapment protection requirements as our exemplar, we began employing this uh, CDC uh, approach. So we began, of course, by engaging the stakeholders. We uh, looked towards uh, our technical committee that helped to draft the revisions to the standard and subsequent revisions, uh, because they represent uh, a certain baseline knowledge of the standard, but also a very good representation of all the stakeholders of the standard. We had jurisdictions having authority, we have manufacturers, we have representatives from the standards development organization and independent uh, testing, inspecting and certifying entities. The difficulty came from almost the get-go, which was getting all these diverse people from actually across the globe together at the same time in the same place. Even attempting to do it virtually uh, was uh, very problematic. So on top of employing this CDC framework, uh, we employed a modified Delphi approach. Uh, enabling individuals to work uh, together towards a consensus as we built uh, this assessment process, but not requiring them to meet together, or at least at the same time. A Delphi process is an iterative, iterative process of individuals providing input, then sharing this anonymized input with the entire group, allowing individuals to reconsider and reissue their input. And this process continues through each stage of the assessment process uh, until we reach a consensus and then can move on to the next stage. So to date, uh, advance the slide, please. We've proceeded through the uh, second phase of describing the program. Now this abbreviated model, which should look very familiar to the chevrons at the bottom of the model that David showed you, was all we needed to assess the impact of this dual entrapment protection. Didn't even need to consider the publication stage, focusing on the awareness uh, and the adoption phases of the life cycle of this UL325 revision. You'll notice also that the model indicates some inputs and outputs. Inputs are those external influences outside the manufacturing organization or organizations that have a facilitative or uh, a prohibitive uh, factor on the uh, individual product manufacturers during that phase. 
The outputs are the evidence of activities by the manufacturers in that phase. So this model was discussed, refined, and finally agreed upon. We then moved on, advance the slide please, to where we are now, which is taking this model and um, identifying the functional, the appropriate inputs and outputs, which will, in our next uh, iteration, become our leading indicators. And this approach was uh, a little bit uh, new to many of the members uh, uh, of our working group. And our working group was composed active working members uh, of our uh, stakeholders, our members of our technical committee. Uh, the first question was to, was, uh, to identify um, all potential external influences on that particular stage of the model. So what were the external influences on awareness? Uh, and what were the external influences on organizations during the adoption phase? And likewise, identify uh, potential sources of evidence that awareness was awareness activities were undergoing uh, by manufacturers and that adoption was undergoing. Uh, to qualify these uh, potential inputs and outputs, they had to be uh, able to be expressed numerically. They may not exist in numeric format uh, when they were first collected, but they had to be able to be quantified in some way. Now, keep in mind, we may be lucky. There may be uh, actual quantitative uh, data already existing out there. For example, um, one of the inputs to the awareness stage that we're looking at is the uh, sales and uh, subscription downloads of UL325 uh, uh, just prior to and just post of that uh, revision date. That's easily quantified, that's already exists quantifiable. Other, uh, other potential uh, inputs, which will become leading indicators in order to be quantified, need take a little work. Perhaps they could be put on a rating scale, one to five, or even a simple yes or no response can be quantified as a binary uh, variable, zero or one. So once these potential inputs and outputs uh, were listed, uh, this little sifting and winnowing to make sure that they could be expressed numerically. And finally, to determine uh, if they were gonna be suitable for being turned into leading indicators, were they reliable? Or in other words, do they have the same implication for all potential adopters? It wouldn't be a particularly good leading indicator if, for example, the CDC's uh, mention of a particular voluntary consensus standard had a very strong positive effect on some manufacturers uh, in the adoption phase perhaps, uh, but for others had no effect whatsoever. So had to be uh, external influence or uh, a some evidence of internal activity in that phase, input or output, had to be able to be expressed numerically and had to have a reliable or consistent implication for all the potential adopters. And at this phase is where we are today. We're continuing on. Uh, we have got uh, our list of potential indicators, and we're going through the uh, somewhat laborsome process of making sure that these uh, indicators can actually date exists that can uh, be applied to them. And that is where we stand uh, today. We expect that uh, We'll be continuing on, moving on to the gathering credible evidence uh, by the beginning of November. And we expect to be complete uh, with a draft report uh, that will be acceptable to all our stakeholder working group uh, by the end of the year. David, have I missed anything? Uh, the only thing I think I'd add um, actually on this one is for those who may not be familiar, dual entrapment requirements, what we're really talking about are the photo eye that you might see on your garage door opener uh, to make sure that that uh, garage door doesn't come down on you or your children. And then the, uh, the, the actual sensor that uh, measures the force with which the uh, garage door comes down. So those are the dual entrapment requirements uh, specifically that we're talking about that. Um, maybe our colleague from the FDA wasn't quite uh, following uh, the idea of dual entrapment requirements. 
Um, and then the other thing that I guess I would add here uh, before we uh, jump into, into questions about the overall presentation is just, as you can see, um, we have continued to be, um, uh, I guess, challenged with all the variations, all the complexities, all the confounding factors that you find when you really dive into one of these uh, impact assessment efforts. Um, and the, the effort associated with bringing a diverse group of stakeholders along um, in this idea of measuring the impact of the standard is as challenging as bringing them together to develop the standard in the first place. So don't underestimate the effort associated with um, managing that stakeholder engagement process as you go through an effort like this. It, it's very much like the standards development process that we all follow, right? You know, you I'm sure everyone's not in their head. You, you've you've been through that process before. You bring new people on there, and there's you know that uh, opportunity that you have to uh, form your group, norm your group, storm your group. Uh, we're somewhere in one of those processes. So that concludes the uh, the formal presentation part of the uh, conversation that we have uh, for you today. Uh, so at this point in time, we invite questions both from the room and online. So I'll just, uh, we're about seven minutes ahead of schedule, by the way. Um, there was a conversation. Um, I think you touched on it, but just to give you a sense of where people's thinking were at. So the question was, what are the units of measurement? And then working group member David Shapiro responded, it could be an effect such as injury reduction with units such as work days lost deaths, cost of treatment, or an effect such as improved disease reporting. And then the response, the person who asked the question, well, that will be hard to multiply in the equation. The results will be in days squared, question mark. I can, so the, the conformance is a non-dimensional number. So whatever is your measure of effectiveness, is your measure of impact. So if you're if, if you're looking at how many lives saved, injuries prevented, how much uh, money is saved, uh, how many work days are are uh, not lost, I guess saved, um, that's going to be your your impact as conformance is non-dimensional. And to add, and, and just to add to that, the effectiveness is is it, it's based on your industry is what is it that you want to measure right so that could be you know we touched upon days lost and all that so that's that could be any type of you know of number that you wish to you wish to be measuring and you know the other part that uh, again we've talked a little bit about is the idea that uh, while it is a uh, while it is a uh, an equation and we're all drawn to you know literally applying the equation uh, you know, part of what I think we've come to understand is that based on the availability of some of the hard information, hard data that's associated with this, and the ability to uh, measure uh, things like uh, conformance, you may be looking at two relatively qualitative factors, and you can still come out with an answer if you say, well, I have high effectiveness, and again, I'll bring up this um, the study that was done by the CPSC on portable generators, the, the effectiveness of the standard was deemed to be very high uh, based on this modeling that was being done there and, uh, you know, 90% potential reduction in the number of uh, carbon monoxide injuries associated with it. Um, so, but because it was through modeling, we have to say that it's the potential of that effectiveness. But the same study then came out and said, the problem is the conformance to that standard is relatively low. The number of products actually being produced to that standard at this point in time is lower than, I would say the CPSC, this is David Roth speaking, not from the CPSC, uh, that uh, it's less than uh, we might like. And as a UL standards and engagement person, who has one of those standards is definitely lower than we'd like to see the adoption and the implementation of that standard. So we have high effectiveness, low, low conformance. Therefore, the impact of that standard 
is somewhere between medium and low. And based on the data that was produced, the estimates that were looked at there, we have to conclude that the impact of UL's portable generator standard right now is relatively low compared to the way that we want to see that. So again, the idea of these numbers and the equation, if you have the data, you know, go for using that formally as an equation, but you can also think of it in a more qualitative way as well. Let me also point out that uh, generators, portable generators are not inexpensive. And uh, the generators that you bought before that didn't meet the uh, standard, you're probably not going to be saying, oh shoot, it doesn't meet the standard. Let me go out and spend $600 on a new one and get rid of my old one, right? You're gonna say, oh, well, you know, this is fine. And, and you'll keep it for however long its lifetime is. So I, again- the Time factor is back. The, the product life, lifetime really plays into this. And we can look at things that, that went into effect, you know, back in the early 80s, and, and we can take a holistic approach now because many of those products have been replaced. Uh, hair dryers is another one. Uh, GFCIs on hair dryers. Uh, I think Andrew will, will know when that went into effect, but it's been at least 30 years. And so chances are nobody has a 30-year-old hair dryer in their home. And, and when you look at, at the effectiveness of that standard, you, you don't have to really play into that uh, time factor anymore because uh, those products have long since left the shelf. But with the, the portable generators, we're very much in that, that time frame that it takes uh, for you to you know, use the, the portable generator to the end of its life and then go buy a new one. Yeah, hello. My name is Brian Zimmer, and I'm an ANSI. Our organization is our ANSI members. Uh, this question is directed to the UL uh, folks, David or Andrew. Um, and the model that you used for analysis so that Andrew presented, I thought, was an excellent model, except that there's no mention of liability, risk, or consequences of not following a standard. Uh, UL, in particular, deals a great deal in the litigious areas as to whether standards were applied when products fail and lives are lost or great costs are incurred. So I'm, I'm surprised that your model doesn't, or an alternate model doesn't measure consequences um, given the, uh, particularly the uh, fact that there's a great deal of in, implicit federal regulations tied to many different elements of a large corporation's performance. You can come at a company from many different angles as a federal regular, not from necessarily from US CPSC, but some of these other people have bigger, tougher handles to whack corporations with and or practically put them out of business. But you don't mention a thing about this in this particularly interesting area of health and safety. You're right next to the FDA, by the way. <laughs> Speaking of consequences. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, you're right. It's not explicitly called out in, in the model as we uh, were presenting it. However, what I would say, and I'll uh, ask Andrew to add to this if he'd like, is Scott talked about the motivations for conformance. And what you've just brought up is very much one of those motivating factors around conformance. And so in a litigious uh, industry and so forth, people may be motivated to have their products comply with that standard, even if it's a voluntary standard, because they want to avoid the consequences of having a product out there that they could be sued for. So it, it's embedded, and it certainly is one of those factors that goes into, um, as I want to look at um, conformance, is this a litigious industry? Therefore, I expect a higher degree of conformance because people don't want to be sued. So Andrew, is there anything that you'd add to that? Sure. Um, thank you for that, that comment. And as a matter of fact, uh, outcomes from civil cases uh, involving uh, products uh, that, uh, for which the standard uh, could be applied was considered by the uh, stakeholder engagement working group as an input uh, to the awareness stage. Uh, I can't discuss whether it's going to make it to the uh, actual uh, leading indicator sta uh, stage or not, but that that discussion uh, did come up. So it's very yeah. likely that it will be factored in. 
I just have one thing to add, although I'm not at UL. Uh, I'll point out that um, there are some other factors in the motivation that I didn't bring up, but like insurance, uh, proactive and reactive to, to lawsuits was, was another one too. And uh, it, it all comes down to, you know, if you don't follow the standard, this is potentially what happens. If you follow the standard, this is potentially the benefit. May I add some comments uh, relative to this? This is Joe Batia. Uh, I am not part of your team of answering questions, but this is a very important issue. And uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. yes. Yeah. So here's a guy who comes from UL and also from ANSI. So I have experience in both. I have a long life experience of uh, not only standards, but also compliance to them. Uh, without compliance, standards are basically not that useful. So I think compliance of some sort is expected. And for our system, we need to worry about compliance of all types for applications of all types. And diversity is you know, humongous. You can't possibly cover it all, but I think uh, this is a very good initiative and it's a very good start. It measures the you know, impact, of consen impact of consensus standards. It's limited to consensus standards, not mandatory ones. So that makes a big difference right there as to the legal and other aspects and financial aspects. Lawsuits will be flowing in different ways. But I think the issue is that what we look to develop standards for is rapidly changing. I'll tell you, tomorrow I'll make comments on this in my annual report. Uh, we're developing new compliance or accreditation offerings and criteria for things that we didn't even think about in the past. Biobanking, trust in journalism, cannabis, uh, how employees fill their talent needs or gaps for usable jobs. These are critical issues now. And there, I mentioned earlier that we were looking at uh, smart standards. ISO is spending the largest proportion, proportion of this pot of money for next year on that for next several years. So there'll be all kinds of needs which currently are not even thought about in any serious way. So I think we have to recognize that the steps that we're taking here are good steps I think we need to engage more constituencies, more engaged people, and more experts to help us do the job. And I think you guys are a good starting point. You have some great ideas, and I liked a lot of your input that you brought in. And I think we need to keep doing more of this. The last time we met, this was in October of last year, to talk about these issues with this very organization working together. So I hope we'll work together uh, in multiple months and years to come with your engagement and engagement of others who are providing the coverage for the type of products which are very needy but are not being attended to as much. WorkCred is another institution of ours which focuses on how people develop competence to meet the needs of the industry and other groups for services that they must have for them to exist and for us to grow as an economy. So I think uh, I don't have any particular criticism for anything that's being suggested because I think it's a very hard area to manage and to continue to expand constantly. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there, was a, there was a comment um, from the person who asked still, about units of measurement. There we go. A comment from the person who asked about units of measurement. Um, they say a subjective evaluation <laughs> is a relationship and not an equation. <laughs> Sorry, Scott. Engineer. Just killing me here. Uh, it, it, you, he's right. It, it is a relationship, um, but it looks so nice as an equation. <laughs> and I'm an engineer, and I really like equations. It makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. Well, the, the other thing I'd, uh, I'd say related to that comment is um, we intend this to be a broadly applicable um, a white paper that can be used across multiple industries, multiple sectors uh, as well. And you know, we see that represented in the working group that's going forward. And so I would also say that there are places where I expect you'll be able to do the equation. And there are other places where you'll be able to document the relationship uh, as that point. And it depends on the product, the life cycle, you know, the, the industry, all those kind of things. So yes. And yes, yes. I mean, it was something that, you know, we came up as is the baseline, right? Something that we could visually show you 
and, you know, that you use to be able to use it and apply it. Right. So it was more of a, a visualization of what we're talking about and what are the factors that go into that. So yes, it could be a, you know, multiplication or just a relationship signal symbol there. And, and the other thing to, to add to that is uh, the reason we're here speaking with you today, both in the room and virtually, is the idea that we know that we don't have it perfectly right at um, this point. And so maybe we do need to revise, you know, how we present these concepts to be less of an equation, more of a relationship. But equally important is something that I would uh, challenge everyone uh, listening is, are there factors are there relationships? Are there pieces that we're missing um, in this idea of how do we measure uh, the, the impact of voluntary consensus standards? Uh, because if, if we're missing a major factor, that's definitely a, a flaw in the model that we're trying to develop here. And it's not final. And, and so we do invite your uh, comments, your suggestions on how to improve that. I'm a big believer in the voluntary standards consensus process. And one of the best parts about it is there's always that option to get smarter after the fact. Andrew, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I I always think the, uh, the quote of the uh, famous statistician, George Box, all models are wrong. Some are just useful. I think <laughs> this is useful. Um, David Shapiro, go ahead, ask your question. Thank you. All right. Th there are two things that I've been thinking about regarding to conformance. One is that you talk about people having the knowledge. There was a recent report by um, the Knight Center did a survey and found out that 20% of Americans that they checked out didn't even know about the bivalent vaccine. So how could they possibly say, hey, I want to get this? And my suspicion is they didn't know about it because the news media they chose to follow didn't pay attention to it. I don't know what we do about that. But the big question I have is for Scott mainly, maybe for Andrew, mainly for Scott. Here's this, you have these products that last a long time, the generator that produces CO and doesn't have the CO sensor and it's not gonna be replaced anytime soon. Well. If there were a recall because there was something that didn't conform with the present standard, the manufacturers would be going out there and saying, bring it in and we will fix it. To what extent is there a possibility to motivate owners and manufacturers to retrofit equipment when there is a relatively small change that would bring it into safety conformance of a particular product? That's, that's, that's what I have. So I, I think that's probably a, a good point to uh, further consider. Um, I can tell you from the world of consumer products, uh, the vast majority of them, as I said before, do not have federally mandated requirements to them. Um, but many of those that do not have uh, mandated requirements have voluntary standards. And they are voluntary until they're not voluntary. And uh, typically, uh, when we make an assertion as to whether we think that there's a substantial product hazard, we will look to see if your product is, is meeting a voluntary standard. And if it's not meeting a voluntary standard and there's an issue, we're probably going to want you to meet that voluntary standard in, in the future. Uh, I can also tell you, um, I don't do this very much anymore, but when I first joined the CPSC, I spent a lot more time on the compliance side. And at least from my experience, a lot of the compliance issues have to do with a process failure and not a product design issue. Uh, you design it one way and somewhere along the lines as you're making it, uh, you have a new paint in place and you didn't realize that uh, it suddenly presents a problem or, or something to that effect. Um, but, but you're right, David, uh, the, the whole aspect of, of uh, retrofit probably needs to be uh, thought about some more and, and put into the, the work that we're working on. The other thing I'd mentioned there is just a, a quick thought around um, the use of this model uh, or this equation and the idea that 
um, you know, if we find that Can't hear you. Through driving awareness of that standard and the benefits of uh, buying products or using products that comply with that standard. Uh, uh, this is Ray, Ray Pang from uh, FDA. Uh, just want to have, I just had a quick thought based on the uh, comment of the relationship versus uh, uh, equation. Uh, is, this, is it better to describe this uh, EC and, and other factors maybe uh, instead of a simple multiplication? That's for you, engineer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another another uh, comment I have is that um, you know I, I especially like the emphasis on you know this is a case dependent uh, in in terms of industry. So all the impact, how you measure it, methodology, uh, the even the, the quantity units, everything is different by um, by different industry. Like I can only speak for public health. You know, in, in our agency, um, that impact can be from um, you know using a better standards can can lead to uh, safer and uh, more effective devices. Um, for us reviewers, you know, a lot of times is um, using the standards make us to uh, to can can lead to a faster regulatory decision making process. So better medical device can um, enter the market faster and and benefit the patients faster. So there are a lot of different you know like factors um, kind of you know you can measure the impacts of it. And the final final thing is. Um, I think the whole thing uh, we can we can de derive it, it's it's kind of a organic iterative process for the entire standard life cycle. Like all these leading indicators and lagging indicators can help. Like for example, if we we can use MDRs safety signals as a driver to feed back into a revision or even a new development of standards, because we saw that we saw the reports, we know there's a safety issue needs to be addressed, and then you know. They may or may not be a current standards um, helping that aspect, so we can we can inject that into it, um, and, and so on and so forth. So this is organic, inter iterative, not just a a sequential happening process. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, and that's one of the ideas behind the leading indicators. If again you've developed the standard and you're not seeing the awareness and the adoption of that standard, well that's the time to start taking action, you know, and, and going back and, and driving some of those other pieces. So I have two, two comments here. Number one, I should have pointed out David Shapiro and Ray are both part of our group. So um, they're not seating us uh, softball questions. Uh, and I'll also say that uh, while I'm an engineer, I'm also a pragmatist and um, a simple multiplication equation is a lot easier to use to sell the concept than a more complex, um, complicated function. Um, certainly uh, we could reformulate it as something that's a little bit more complex, but I'm afraid we're gonna start losing engineers and probably just be left with like the PhD mathematicians. <laughs> so um, uh, personally, I, I think we should stick with the easy side of it. And uh, I think we'll, we'll catch a lot more people with that than getting uh, more complex. But I know what you're saying and, and you're right. Uh, there, there is a, it's, it's a lot more than just that simple equation, but that simple equation really just kind of highlights what we're dealing with. I've got a I've got a question here at this table next to you. Yeah. Barry Chase for the NFPA. Uh, as an engineer, I also appreciate equations, so it works for me. But you know, sort of where where my brain has gone thinking about this as a concept um, is that there's actually a relationship between the effectiveness and the mm -hmm. uh, the conformity. 
because it's it comes down to the decisions made by the committees that write these standards, right? Every decision they make in a standard is made up of a bunch of decisions has an effect and whether it'll be conformed to. And so there's that relationship there from a from the standards development perspective. Uh, and I find it fascinating to think about the need for the different uh, interest categories to be at the table because you can have a room full of engineers who like equations that say this is the most effective way. And those engineers are gonna say, let's make every building out of stone and steel. Uh, but I don't think anybody on the other side of that equation wants to live in that world, right? The, uh, so there's this balance. Then I think that there's somewhere in there the definition of consensus of where you land uh, to maximize effectiveness and conformity to get the highest impact that you can. So that's what I've been thinking about and, uh, you know, sort of going down the path of when you think about the interaction of those two things, um, the impact of prescriptive standards versus performance-based, allowing people to make decisions so they're more likely to conform with the effectiveness that they can conform to. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I don't, <laughs> no specific question, but this, I wanted to share the sort of the thoughts I had on meaning of that equation as a concept in the standards development world. No, go ahead. Uh, uh, sorry. Um, so, so the conform the standards committees that are are making this right. They, they're making both decisions based on the effectiveness and conformance. I think that's that's a given. Anyone who's worked on a committee knows that that sometimes there are decisions made just to improve the conformance to the standard. I, I, that goes without saying. Um, I'll one up you on on the relationship between conformance and effectiveness. Uh, when you're looking through the data, the data isn't differentiating between conformance and effectiveness sometimes. So it, it's not an easy solution to that equation. The equation is simple as we just talked about, but the practical side of it is maybe not so much. Um, so yeah, th there is an interdependency between the two. We recognize that. And, you know, really complex detailed analyses will, will need to account for that. But the high level stuff, we can kind of get around it, you know. Um, so I will now let, I think Diana had something to say. You no, know, I was, I wanted to kind of um, ask, you know, kind of ask Barry to, to clarify what you were talking about. You're talking about within the standard development process itself, right? And, and how do we apply the effectiveness or the conformance to that actual standard itself? Is, Co yeah, correct. Right? So, uh, and how do we do, how do we do it from like that in inception stage first or the, I, that's right. Called, and right. About versus afterwards committees, the committees and how do we build this formula into action. what they're looking at, right. At that committee level. And I think that's, that's a great idea. Cause that was one of the things that I had been thinking of as well is how do I take this information as a, you know, as an SDO and make our, our, commit, our product groups and our standard development groups aware of, of this equation and what it entails and to build on that as they're revising a standard or as they're developing a standard, right? How do we factor into the, you know, factor that into the actual standard itself? So thanks for that, Barry, for bringing it up. Yeah, and I, and I think the, uh, building on that, I think one of the things that I would say is our technical committee chairman kind of inherently know those, as you said, those trade-offs, you know, if, if we, you know, increase the uh, specificity of that requirement, then the, you know, the conformance will go down. And so they're probably um, in the back of their mind, not even consciously doing that balancing equation that you're talking about. And so again, thinking about how do I use the concept that we're presenting here is maybe having it more explicit saying, well, hey, if we implement this requirement, we're decreasing the conformance, but we're increasing the effectiveness. Does that get us where we want to be, which is higher impact? Right. So it might be more explicitly used that way. I think we have time for one more question. 
Yeah, so just real briefly on the chat, there were some supportive comments from Joe Musso of UL, um, Tim Fisher of ASSP, another working group member, basically just great job, you know, continue the conversation, we need to have good stories Thanks, to tell. There was a comment from another uh, participant and says, in medical facilities, motivation to comply may also be affected by accreditation, insurance, and the recruitment and retention of staff, as well as the public perception of the safety of the facility. Absolutely, and I think the workplace, you know, the idea of, you know, employment in a place that is a safe workplace. Yeah, and I think when we dig, once, once we get the paper out there and you start digging into that conformance, there are so many different aspects of that conformance that you can get that, you know, that it gets into. And you'll find that a lot of that will fall under that, um, in that, you know, in that category. All right. Well, there are no more questions online. Anyone else has any? If not, we'll, um, Thank our speakers for a terrific job. And if you have more questions, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer them. And just make, just make one more pitch for the idea that this is a working group. Uh, we're always looking for folks that uh, can, can can contribute to the effort that we're working on here. And again, please uh, send us feedback. Uh, through email as well, if you uh, you know support the idea of a function uh, versus a relationship versus an equation, or again, more specifically, what are we missing? Because we've been working at this, we're looking at this very closely. So um, ideas, your ideas, your input are welcome. So thank you.